Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back for this afternoon session. We'll uh, continue with Carlos's lecture series. The, uh, today's lecture is titled uh, The Bo Bogomol of Giesecker Inequality and the Geography of the Moduli of Vector Bundles. Okay, great. great. So thank you very much. Uh, this is a great pleasure to continue. Uh, uh, so let me start. Uh, let me start with the Bogomol of Giesecker Inequality. That's the title of the talk. So here X is a higher dimensional compact, maybe let's say Kähler. Taylor manifold, uh, so for some parts of the proof, maybe algebra, maybe, maybe projective would be better. Um, <coughs> just for example, let's take X as surface. Okay. So now I'd like to recall the Hodge-Riemann bilinear relations. Let's just do this by doing a calculation. So let's just calculate on a surface. So maybe I should say here, omega is the Kähler metric. Kähler form. Okay. So uh, just to simplify everything, let's uh, have the coordinates D, uh, uh, z1 and z2. Oh, sorry. And let's just suppose that omega equals dz1, dz1 bar plus dz2, dz2 bar. So I'm going to be ignoring some kind of global constant. But of course, the, the, the main point of what I want to say here is, it is a sign change. Uh, but that sign change is, let's say, modulo some square root of minus 1 or something like that global thing. But we're going to see a sign change. So and let's just write this as uh, 1, 1 bar plus 2, 2 bar to Make things short, okay? Uh, and so, you know, uh, one of the main things about Kähler manifolds is there's this osculation principle that says that uh, you can always choose a system of coordinates uh, locally at, at a single point where omega looks like this. Um, and what, we'd, what I like to say here is just for a single point. Okay, so let's look at two forms. Okay, and we would like to look at the, the we'd like to say alpha comma beta is equal to alpha wedge beta bar, okay? Then sort of integrate over x. So, uh, Let's look at what, in fact, one one forms. So this the, this is the thing which is relevant for what I'm going to do next because uh, the curvature form is going to be a two form, and in fact, the curvature form is going to be a one one form. Okay. So let's just uh, look exactly at how this uh, what happens when we do this. Okay, so if we take the Kähler form, omega omega wedge omega bar, that's going to be uh, one one bar plus two two bar times uh, 1 bar 1 plus 2 bar 2, OK? And of course, dz, you're not allowed to repeat anything. So if we take dz1 times dz1, that's going to be 0, right? Because it's exterior algebra. So when we put all this together, we get, uh, we're going to get 1, 1, 1 bar. So th these term, this term is 0, so it's 1, 1 bar, 2 bar, 2 plus 2, 2 bar, 1 bar, 1, OK? And which is going to be, let's say, minus uh, 1, 1 bar, 2, 2 bar, plus. Now, he here we can switch. Remember, you can, if you, if you interchange one, uh, one thing, then it's a minus sign. But if you we can interchange blocks of two without any minus sign. So 
minus this whole thing. So if we switch this one around here and then do the other, I mean, if we put the one bar here and then switch the two, this is going to be the same. So this is two times. There's two terms, two, two of the same term, okay? So we'll think of this as our positive, uh, right? The, you know, the, inter, the integral of, well, let's see, well, the Kähler form is supposed to be real, so up to some sign, omega bar should be the same as omega. Uh, so this we might say will be, our one, I mean, this is one of our terms, okay? So, this, so uh, now the point is that the, 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 the one one forms decomposes as the forms generated by omega, uh, right, I guess omega bar is just minus omega, okay. Uh, this decomposes as the forms generated by omega plus the forms perpendicular to omega. Uh, let's call these, and uh, let's call this the primitive forms. This is everything you have to do in the Hodge theory in order to get a positive definite inner product uh, on, on, the, on the cohomology. Okay? But we're interested in seeing how this actually works precisely in this case of 1-1 of one, one form. Okay? So this is going to be everything generated by 1-1 one, one bar plus 2-2 two, two bar, this part. And this part, so this is what's the perpendicular? It's going to have 1-2 two bar, 2-1 uh, bar. And then it's going to have the, the thing with the minus here, 1, 1 bar minus 2, 2 bar. Okay. So now let's take, so if we, we've seen here what happens if we do alpha wedge, well, wedge alpha bar to omega, okay? We get this thing, right? This is omega. So now let's try, let's try alpha equals 1, 2 bar. Okay. What's alpha wedge alpha bar? That's going to be, one, two bar, and the bar is one bar, two, right? So that, if we move that around a little bit, then that's going to be minus one, one bar, two bar, two, which is plus uh, one, one bar, two, two bar, which is what the, the, the normal form we had here. So this is opposite sign, okay? And if, if we take alpha equals uh, 2, 1 bar, it's the same. And then let's just do, to finish this off, let's just take 1, 1 bar minus 2, 2 bar. Then what's alpha wedge alpha bar? That's going to be 1, 1 bar minus 2, 2 bar times 1 bar 1 minus 2 bar 2. Remember the one, the ones with the ones, that's zero. So this is going to be minus uh, one, one bar, two bar, two, minus two, two bar, one bar, one. And again, if we switch, or if we switch the two, two bar here, we can switch this one and then switch the two. This is gonna, again going to be plus uh, one, one bar, two, two bar, plus one, one bar. Two bar, okay. two of the same. If I if I write two times that, that's going to be confusing, right? Because if I put a two here and then two times something, so uh, okay. So so this is again opposite sign. So what's the conclusion? I and mean, this is just a standard calculation, but I think you know, uh, I mean, half of you did this in class uh, last week or something, probably, but. Uh, Maybe some people don't remember this. Uh, okay, so I just want to do this calculation. What's the conclusion? The conclusion is that if we take use the form uh, alpha, you know, alpha comma beta maps to alpha wedge beta bar, uh, then this has this has a, a, one sign on everything generated by omega and the opposite sign. on the primitive part, okay? 
Now, how's that going to affect us? So now, suppose we have a bundle. So now, now I should do something about bundles and connections. Okay. So uh, this was I was supposed to do this yesterday, but uh, so now now vector bundles and connections. So the, let's get to the, to the right to the main thing that we need, which is that if we have E as a vector bundle, and if H is a Hermitian metric on E, then it, so it means that we have you know E comma F H. E comma E. If he's non-zero, then E E is positive. Okay. So we have a vector bundle with a Hermitian metric on E. Then the kind of the basic lemma here is so let's uh, set D prime D double prime just be, by definition to be the D bar operator of E. So what's going on here? So this means that um, this is, so a holomorphic vector bundle. So this is an operator on the C infinity bundle. Right? Remember, one way of having a holomorphic structure for a bundle is to have a C infinity bundle plus a D bar operator. We'll just call that the double prime. Then the lemma is that there exists a unique operator d prime h such that uh, if we do the, well, such that let's say the, the, the connection, uh, so uh, so d, double, d prime h goes from C infinity sections of E to one zero forms. Uh, this d double prime went to zero one forms. What we're going to be doing tomorrow with Higgs bundles is that we'll have operators that are called d double prime and d, d prime. It's just that the type of the form is not going to be fixed. But they're going to play the same role as, as these operators. But today we're just talking about vector bundles. So, uh, so there's, the lemma is that there's a unique operator such that, the, such that d h, which is d prime h plus d double prime, so this is a map from is a connection operator. So this is D goes from C infinity of E to, to all the one forms with coefficients in E. And you know D of A E equals A D of E plus D A times E. Right. This is the Leibniz rule that says that it's a connection, okay. such that parallel transport for D preserves H. And the infinitesimal version of that says that little d of e comma f h equals d e f plus e d f. Well, you have to think a little bit about what this actually means, because here we're not taking the scalar product of forms, we're, of, of, of sections of e. We're taking the scalar product of a form times a section. So that just means the form, the dz parts of the, form, of the one forms, you just pull out of the thing. And here, since it's a Hermitian in product, you take the, you'll pull out the one form, but with a with a complex conjugation. In in my case, the Hermitian property is on the second variable. I know that some people put the Hermitian property on the first variable, which I, I don't understand why, but I guess it makes something easier. But no. Here, the Hermitian property is on the second variable. Okay, so um, 
So, so the, this is the basic lemma, you know, from, from, I learned this from Griffith's class, um, but it's a standard lemma, which is that if you have a holomorphic structure operator, then uh, if, you, if you're given a metric, then there exists a unique uh, connection compatible with the holomorphic structure operator. That's, the, that's just saying that the, the second, the zero, one term of the connection is, is given, is this given operator, and which preserves the, the unitary structure. So we have metric gives us a connection, right? So now, of course, not every connection is going to be good because otherwise you would just choose any kind of metric you want, and then you would have a nice connection. Uh, so what what do we have is we have the curvature. So f is just d squared. But the point is that the, the Leibniz formula sort of cancels out here in some way. So this is actually an operator. This is just given by a section. This is just given by a two-form with coefficients in the endomorphism of the bundle. And f equals 0 says that the connection is flat. <coughs> what does flat mean for, this is for the uh, more beginning people in the audience. Flat means uh, that the parallel transport is independent of the choice of path. So if anybody here is just starting out in the subject, you should definitely think about this a little bit yourself, which is to say that when you do this infinitesimal operation of taking the square of the operator and thinking of that as a two-form, that's actually going to tell you, when you if, you if you take a little, this is a two-form, so it, it kind of eats up pairs of vectors, right? A two-form, I mean, an n-form eats up n-tuples n of vectors. A two-form eats up two pairs of vectors, gives you an answer in the endomorphism of the bundle, and what is that? It says, if you go a little bit in this direction, and then a little bit in this direction, then back and back, then you get a transformation, an infinitesimal transformation of the bundle. Uh, that's the endomorphism of the bundle. That tells you how much the parallel transport is not independent of the choice of path. Okay. And if you like, write that, if you think about that and then try to write it down, you're going to, if you do that correctly, you'll come up with this formula. Okay. And so if f equals 0, then it just like, if you have a big loop, if you can divide up that big loop into a zillion little, little squares like that, and if f equals zero, then on each little square up to a cubic order of magnitude or something like that, it's zero. So, so then the, the parallel transport is zero. Okay. That's kind of the proof by picture. Uh, so in some sense, our, our, I mean, our goal, I mean, not necessarily a goal, but I mean, one thing you can try to do is to try to say, okay, do we have a flat connection? Uh, that's, in fact, the Narasimha and Sachadri theorem. Uh, okay, so, so that's the curvature. Uh, oh, now what do I want to say? Okay, now what about the churn forms? So I guess this is probably something like some constant of CH the churn character. Over some cycle sigma. A 2p cycle. This is just going to be given by integration over the cycle of the trace of f wedge f p times. So in particular, CH1, CH1 of E, uh, there's a constant here. Just so nobody complains, right? <laughs> I can put constants everywhere. Um, CH1 of E is, uh, uh, but let's do CH1 of we, E wedge omega to the n minus 1, right? Let's look at this on the class of x. 
So, um, you know, CHP, this is a, this is a 2P form. And maybe what I should say here is that in our case, this F is actually a 1, 1 form. So this is, this is actually a PP form. So the, the, the turn, this is the turn character, and then to get to the turn class, there's a formula and so on, which you can look up. Uh, this is, in terms of curvature, this is easier to write down. Uh, and I guess the way to remember that is that the turn character is the thing which is compatible both with direct sum and with tensor product. And if you think about writing this formula, uh, this is going to be compatible with both direct sum, where you just make blocks and like that. And I mean, if you take a direct sum bundles, then you're just going to get the direct sum here. And also, if you think about it, if you take tensor product of bundles, you're also going to get the product. OK, so, uh, so, so CH1 of E, which is really the same as C1 of E. CH1 of E wedge omega to the n minus 1, uh, then evaluated on the class of x. This is just integral over x of the trace of f times omega n minus 1. And if we go back here, I think I, that's what I was claiming. I mean, I don't see it at, at, uh, on the moment. You can see if you can think if you're if you're getting bored of the talk, you can try to figure that out. I mean, of course, the product structure is on the sum of the of these guys. Remember the in the turn character, the first term is the rank of the bundle. Uh, it's supposed to be easy to see if you take a tensor product of two bundles. The you take the product. I mean, uh, but you, anyway, let, let's not do that here. But uh, that, I, I mean, I've done that before in my life, and it was easy to see. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, so so what I'm saying here. So now the, the other thing to observe here is that there's this operator called lambda, capital lambda, uh, which essentially is the projection onto this factor. Okay, so the lambda from two forms into function. So lambda, in fact, it usually goes from n from you know k forms into k minus two forms. And it's the adjoint of wedging with the Kähler form. Okay. In our case, it's a, like, a little easier to understand. It just goes from two forms back to functions. It's just that lambda, lambda of a two-form alpha is the projection than some constant, like poly n. I think this is maybe n, maybe the rank of the, maybe the dimension of the variety possibly. Uh, so, but lambda of a, so lambda of a two form is basically just projection of the two form onto this factor. Okay. So it means it's zero on all this stuff, and it just picks out this part. Okay. Well, if you think about it a little bit, the wedging with if you take a two form and you wedge with omega n minus one and then integrate that, that's going to throw out all the other stuff. Uh, though, I mean, these, these, this is perpendicular to omega, which is to say if you wedge all this stuff with omega, you got zero, and you can see that. So this is also equal to the integral over x of just lambda, of trace of lambda times f. So when I say write lambda times f, right, lambda was an operation on forms, and f is an endomorphism valued form. So we just apply it to the forms and leave the endomorphism. Then we take out the endomorphism by taking the trace. Here, n equals dimension of x. Okay. And then there's some constant here. And this is just going to be the degree of the bundle. This is called the degree of the bundle. So in the case of x being a projective variety, so if x if x is sitting inside some projective space and the Kähler form is the Kähler form of the ox of 1, then the degree, this is just the degree 
Uh, so for example, it's, it's equal to the degree of the bundle. For, you can see from here, this omega is the same as hyperplane class. So if you took an intersection with n minus one hyperplane sections, that would be a curve inside x. And this would be the degree of the bundle restricted to the curve. Okay. That's just the degree. So what we're interested in looking at is CH2. So CH2 of E wedge omega n minus 2 evaluated on x. This is going to be integral over x of trace of f wedge f times omega to the n minus 2. Now, let's go back here. So let me erase over here. Um, so let's make a hypothesis to make my formulas correct, or at least somewhat more correct, and stuff like that, and remove some complicated uh, extraneous uh, things. So let's hypothesis. is that the determinant of the bu determinant bundle of E, that means lambda R E, is equal to OX, is trivial. So in particular, C1 of E equals 0. And we'll, we'll assume that H is compatible. You know, determinant of H equals 1. And this tells us that, in fact, the trace itself of F equals 0. Not, not, not only the integral of the trace equals zero, but in fact, the trace itself equals zero. Uh, you can just, uh, that doesn't, it doesn't really matter too much because you can tensor, you can tensor with a line bundle and you could say, okay, if, uh, if you didn't have a line bundle, then in fact, this was um, Professor Narasimhan's paper, uh, you could even add a parabolic structure so that you can tensor with a line bundle <laughs> of some real degree that you want. Um, just uh, assume that. Okay, so, uh, so under that hypothesis, then CH2 equals C2. Uh, maybe it's minus C2, probably. Uh, now let's decompose. So let's write F equals lambda F and then times omega, right? Lambda f was the projection. Lambda f was a function, was a scalar, but the projection onto the omega. And I think you're supposed to put a 1 over n here. At least that's what I saw. Uh, plus the f primitive. Okay, So let's write f as it in, decomposed into two pieces according to this decomposition. Okay. Now let's look at integral over x of trace of f wedge f. Times omega to the n minus 2. Okay. So the claim is that this is equal to, uh, up to some constant, this is equal to the, uh, to the form. Uh, I mean, this is equal to this is equal to our form here. Oh, sorry, maybe this is a round thing. Using our form, using our, uh, I mean, I, yeah. This is this is our pairing. Uh, why is that? Well, it's basically because f is a, f is a real or a, a, f is really maybe purely imaginary uh, because of the condition that the connection preserves the. The condition that the, connection, that the connection preserves the, the, the metric says that the, the parallel transport sort of only goes in a rotational direction. And the, so, uh, so F bar, so F is basically F bar. Okay. Uh, so what's the conclusion, which I'm about to erase here, but okay. erase it here. That's not what Remember, our, our pairing is to, to wedge. Okay. 
But the conclusion is that this is, uh, so uh, what we had was our pairing Our pairing had opposite signs on A, on the primitive pieces and on the, the part generated by omega. So this is gonna be basically uh, something like the norm of F primitive, the L2 norm of F primitive, minus the L2 norm of lambda F. That's the conclusion from our opposite sign stuff. This is from. And as I said, there's constants all over here, which I'm, you, don't want, you wouldn't want to see, and I, don't, I wouldn't want to try to get right, because I'd probably get them wrong. Uh, but in any case, the, the main point is that whatever the constants are, there's a sign difference here. Okay. What you might expect, because you're not going to have the, the I mean, you can write, just re easily write down an example where the turn class is negative. Uh, if you start writing down examples where the turn class is negative, you'll observe that they're all unstable, okay? because of, in fact, the theorem. Uh, okay, so, but so, so this is sort of telling us what's happening, which is that the, the turn class, so this is, so this is gonna be, remember this is integral This is integral over x of trace of f wedge f omega to the n minus 2, which is CH2 of, of E wedge omega n minus 2 evaluated on x. So this is a topological invariant. Now we can see this. So, that, so I'm trying to use this to motivate, um, among other things to motivate what we're gonna do next, which is this motivates or should motivate uh, why we would like to make this zero. Or we could try to make this zero, for example, but uh, as you can see, as we, as we saw here, this has three different terms, right? And this has only one term, so maybe it's easier to make it zero. Um, <coughs> and in fact, that, I mean, it's true that the, the making this zero is an elliptic equation. It's like the Laplacian. Whereas if you tried to make this zero, it would be, uh, uh, overdetermined system of equations. So, so what do we do? We try to make we try to make lambda f equals zero, and then then we get a sign. Okay. So now let me state the theorem. So the theorem is that if this is Donaldson, Uhlenbeck, Yao, and this is Donaldson, Simon, Sechadri in dimension one, and Donaldson, Uhlenbeck, Yao. Higher dimensions. And as I was saying yesterday, so the, this whole subject got sort of started anew when Donaldson gave a wrote a paper saying a new proof of not the theorem of Narasimhan and Sushadri. So. So this theorem, so uh, theorem of Professor Narasimhan and Professor Sechadri for the case of curves. Uh, then, then Donaldson gave a Yang-Mills theory proof of first surfaces. Then, uh, if I'm not mistaking the history here, then Donaldson also gave a proof in general, but, which I think used the meta romanathan restriction theorem. Uh, and then Ulan Gao gave a proof uh, in higher dimensions. Uh, and their proof in, introduced an important uh, an important aspect, which is the regularity of L21 subsheaves. Uh, then I sort of, like, in my thesis kind of like boil all that stuff together to try to come up with a, an optimal version of the proof. Okay, so. Uh, so, so what's the theorem? The theorem says that if, that 
uh, E is uh, slope uh, polystable if and only if it has a Hermit Yang Mills or Hermit Einstein. I don't know what we want to call this, but Hermit, what something or other, uh, metric, which is to say lambda FH equals, so in the general case, it's equal to some scalar times the identity matrix. And in our case, Determinant, if determinant equals O, is OX, then, then it says lambda F equals zero. And the corollary, so I guess this was known before, right, by Bogomol Giesiger. which is that if, if E is, in fact, even just semi-stable, in fact, it suffices to have Giesecker semi-stable, right, which one is easier? Slope semi-stable or Giesecker semi-stable? Which one's, slope. slope is easier, so this should, this should be true for slope, in fact. Uh, if E is slope semi-stable, then, uh, then C2. Then in the case, in the case C1 equals zero, then that means C2 of E uh, wedge omega n minus two on X is, is positive and equality if and only if flat. Uh, so let, let me just discuss in the general case, uh, this really says, so let, I'll, I'll define this in a minute, delta of E is positive, and equality if and only if projectively flat. Uh, what's delta? Uh, it's C2 minus R plus 1 over 2R times C1 squared. This is the quantity, oh, let's say, this is the quantity This is the quantity that's invariant under E maps to E tensor L. It's invariant, it's invariant under a tensor ring with line bundle. Uh, I mean, the, the, just saying C, I mean, so you, we think C2 is positive. That's not really true. I mean, if, you, if, you, if the degree is not zero, then it's not. Really true, but, uh, because, it, I mean, uh, I, I made this assumption that the determinant was trivial. If you didn't make that assumption, then there's a lot of little things you need to add to the formulas here. Uh, with the net, and net result, which is easy to understand, which is just that the quantity we want to talk about here is the one which is an invariant under tensoring with line bundle. And this includes tensoring with a parabolic line bundle, so uh, you can do a lot of removal of, uh, of first turn class that way. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so this, so the, the kind of, so what's the basic conclusion is that this constrains the geography of the theory of moduli. Uh, 
and dimension bigger than or equal to two. And so there's a, maybe, a, let me just mention, uh, I guess yesterday apparently I mentioned what Dan was about to talk about without really quite realizing it. <laughs> but, um, so the thing I was asking about yesterday is maybe sort of the subject of Dan's lectures. And so this may be, uh, where's Emmanuel? Uh, yeah. So, so this is a question which I might possibly be treated in Emmanuel's talk. Uh, but anyway, it has been treated by Emmanuel and some other people in some cases. But there's, a, I think, an important question, which is, can we say anything? about the higher term classes. Okay. Right, this tells us some kind of constraint on the second term class. Uh, so like an immediate question which should come to mind, but it, not, not the, the answer is by no means immediate. Uh, I, mean, I, don't think with, there, I don't think anything very much general is known, but I think, I think you have some special, some, some results in, in some cases. I'm not sure anybody's even really tested this out in terms of, uh, you know, trying to calculate examples and things like that. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, pretty. I, I, Adrian Longer has pretty much given algebraic proofs of all types of things like this, <laughs> using. I, yeah, I guess. I mean, I think the original proofs. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bogomolov's, I think Bogomolov's inequality was n not quite as good. Uh, it was like with a four or something. I mean, there was a four instead of a three or some kind of thing like that. Uh, Yeah, so I guess, so maybe I should say, yeah, I guess long, long arrow is the case of the Higgs case. Uh, I mean, what, part of the story here is that this, this, all this stuff kind of, you can just like rewrite the entire board. You just have to remove, whenever I said a, a, the type of a form, one, zero, and zero, one, and so on, you just have to remove those, those little indices, and pretty much everything is supposed to work for Higgs. Yeah, so I guess, I think so, yeah, yeah. I mean, this was before Donaldson theory, right? So it had to be other, right? Yeah, yeah. For some of the Higgs case, and I think that was your, that you were the person who asked the question, in fact, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah. But that wasn't, yeah, analytically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but so I think, the, the, I mean, the new, the new part, the, the new part which was added by, by all this, uh, uh, by the analytic theory is the case of equality. That was not known for Giesinger, I think. Okay, so, uh, so that's the bogomolov giesecker inequality, how we do it for time. Uh, so I'd like to come back, but so let me now take, the, take a break and go back to what I wanted to talk about yesterday, which we didn't finish. Um, and then after that, maybe I'll come back to my, uh, my m more precise comments about you know, what, what we can try to look at in terms of geography of moduli spaces. Um, kind of motivated by the bogomolov giesecker inequality. But let's first, before we do that, let's go back to, to have, a, have a viewpoint on the, uh, uh, have a view of the proof of this thing. Because this is very nice and it's also related to the, it's, it's related to this question of motivating stability, okay? So proof of the main, proof of the theorem, the corollary is, the corollary is supposed to be obvious, right? Because if we have a metric such that this equals zero, then this is positive, okay? And, it, and, it, and if it equals zero, then that's, that's equal to zero, so the curvature is zero, it's flat. Okay. So how to prove So this is kind of a combination of Donaldson's second proof. So Donaldson 2 and Mullenbeck Yao.
So what's the point? So what's the main construction? The main construction is Donaldson functional. Uh, so M of HK. So maybe I should like little H little K. I mean, here on the board here, my, my metric is called little H. Okay, but, so these are metrics. So these are two metrics. And so let's write uh, H equals K times E to the S, okay? So S is self adjoint. So one, one po important point is that we can just write down a formula. This comes after reading a little bit of Donaldson's papers. After a while, you realize, oh, there was a formula. Um, it's just the integral of the trace of S times lambda F. Uh, lambda f, which one? K, I guess. Uh, I hope that's correct. Plus then an integral of something or other, which is we take um, we take d double prime d bar of uh, of s, and then we apply some psi thing. This is probably. This is, I mean, this is maybe, forget exactly. Uh, so what's, so what's psi? Psi is an operator on the endomorphisms of the bundle. Uh, that multiplies by e to the lambda 2 minus lambda 1 minus lambda 2 minus lambda 1 minus 1 over lambda 2 minus lambda 1 squared on the lambda 2 comma lambda 1 eigenspaces of S acting on matrices. Okay, the, the things which go in here, the, you know, this is the connection and so on, those are matrices, right, because they're endomorphous, but endo values in the endomorphisms of the bundle. And the bun if we're given in self -adjoint, uh, a self-adjoint matrix, we can divide the bundle up into eigenspaces of the self-adjoint matrix. Then the, 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 the endomorphisms of the bundle get divided up into, into, you know, a square array, depending on two eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two. And on the lambda 1, lambda 2, or lambda 2, lambda 1 eigenspace, you multiply by this function. What is this function? Uh, as I was thinking, drawing this last night. This function is something which looks a lot like the exponential function, but it's so like e to the x, and it's like 1 over x, 1 over absolute value of x. It's a function which kind of interpolates between 1 over absolute value of x in negative range and e to the x in the positive range. So maybe, uh, maybe log of this function might be a good thing to, to to use for machine learning or something, but, anyway, but uh, yeah. this looks a little bit like the activation function um, for neurons. But anyway, uh, so but I mean we don't need to know precisely. But there, I mean there's one important point here, which is that if lambda two is much bigger than lambda one, then this looks exponential. Okay, uh, it's exponential in terms of s. And the, the, met the metric was just the metric, okay? So uh, it was, was also exponential on S, so it looks like sort of uh, the, s the size of the metric. So uh, anyway, so that's the fun. But so the, I mean, one main point here is that we can just write down the functional, which is not completely clear when you start with what's the main property. But the main property. Is that the, the variation of the functional in terms of the of the the h? Uh, maybe I should also say just like m of h 
k plus, it's in some kind of co-cycle, m of k l equals m, you know, plus m of l h equals zero or something. This is, the, the function is a, of the two variables is a co-cycle. And the variation of the function, well, well, we can actually see this from the formula. Once we know that it's a co-cycle, then to calculate the variation, we can make h and k very close together and just vary one. Then we can see that the, this, this is a quadratic term, so the only term here is this thing. Right, so the variation of the function is just, uh, is the integral of the trace of h inverse delta h, the variation of h, times lambda f. This is H. Uh, okay. So in particular, if we're at a critical point, uh, well, this is just the calculus of variation, right? At a critical point, that, if the variation is zero, that means that this thing has to be perpendicular to that, which tells you that this has to be zero. So the goal is just to try to find a critical point. So, uh, the, and more precisely, the idea is to flow towards a critical point. But I think some people have done this using a, a, a continuity method and, or something like that, using like a minimization. You can, there's other ways of trying to find a, a, a critical point of the function. You don't need to use the heat flow, but this is Donaldson's basic idea is to use the heat flow. So, uh, d h t d t, uh, so h t inverse d h t d t. Uh, you have to think a little bit about what this means, okay? But it mean, does mean something. And again, there might be a constant like a square root of minus one here or something, but. Uh, but you basically, I mean, uh, of course, the way you figure out the constant here is you write the, the leading term of this, you write the symbol of this operator, and you make it so it's Laplacian, and you make it so that's a heat equation, okay? Uh, okay, so, so there's, an, but then of course it has nonlinear terms, so it's a nonlinear heat, heat equation. Uh, so, you know, Hamilton's theory uh, et cetera. Maybe Hamilton's theory is what you need on the non-compact case. But, uh, you know, the Eels and Sampson for harmonic maps uh, is a very similar uh, kind of heat flow. So people had done the theory in order to get the exist long time existence. Okay. Now the question is, does the, is, the, is the heat flow going to converge to a minimum? So to get the heat flow to converge to a minimum, well, there's a bunch of estimates and stuff like that. And many of the estimates that you need are actually contained in Donaldson's first paper. Uh, well, maybe his, I mean, Donaldson's surface paper. Uh, I guess that some versions of them were contained in his curve paper, but uh, all the sort of Sobolev theory and stuff like that is all sort of explained in Donaldson in the first paper. I know, but uh, um, if you just write down, you, you would like to write down this functional, but that's not going to have any invariance properties because this is k. Right? We said there, it's a functional of two metrics, but typically we'll just leave k as a fixed metric. But it's, it's got, I mean, it's kind of important to understand this cocycle property when you vary the two metrics in order to make this calculation, for example. But typically you let, let k be fixed, and then we'll let h vary. But this formula is not this, I mean, if we try to write down this, I mean, S is the difference from H to K. If we write down this, it's not going to be the right answer. In particular, I mean, if you differentiate this thing, you're not going to get that formula. You need this, this extra term, this extra stuff is there to make that true. And this whole thing, this whole thing is, um, it comes from the theory of like uh, secondary invariance. I mean, I, th I mean, maybe if Jaya, Jaya can tell us on Thursday, maybe, but um, it, it's a secondary churn class type of a thing. First, I mean, this, this property tells you that it's some kind of secondary invariant. 
the, the thing which makes the whole thing possible, on the other hand, is the fact that you can actually write down a formula, which is not completely obvious. I mean, you, once you, this property kind of determines the functional, right? So what you can do is write, you can write down this formula and then work a lot to differentiate it and see that it satisfies that property, and then we're good. Okay. But if you didn't have this term, well, also this term is going to be what's making, making our proof work also, but if we didn't have this term, then it, wouldn't, it would only satisfy that to first order around when H and K are very close together. It's a functional for S, yeah. But, but of course, it depends on the initial K. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, kind of, so the, the one, so basic, basic uh, stuff, uh, which we're not going to do here, obviously, tells, the, tells you that to get a convergence, To a minimum, basic. So uh, maybe I should say, of course, I think this should be obvious, but uh, right, d by dt of m of h t k is equal to minus the L2 norm of lambda f h. Right. So as long as lambda f h stays different from zero, then this is just going down. So of course, if it, since it's decreasing, then m is going to be bounded above, right? To get it converged to a minimum, the main thing we need is a C0 bound for h or equivalent t or equivalently s. Uh, if we're given. Let me insist by th this is a fixed thing, let's say k0, okay? So if we're given a fix, we fix the metric k0 and we look at m of ht k0, and we look at that as a function of t, we'd like to get a c0 bound for, for the metric if we're given an upper bound for the function, for the functional, okay? And now why is this true? Well, let's say the basic reason why this is true, so idea. The idea of the proof of this is suppose we didn't have a C0 bound. Uh, maybe I should also say uh, by some other considerations, it's like an L1 bound is good enough also. I mean, Uh, by something other considerations, which I'm not going to say here, but then, the, in fact, the L1 norm actually has to go to infinity also. Um, and with M of K e to the S I K bounded. Suppose we have a sequence where, where you don't have a C0 bound, then what's going to be happening? What could be happening? Then we can rescale, let's call it U I is SI over the L1 norm of SI. Okay. Then so what turns out to, to happen is that then it turns out that UI basically approaches some sum of projectors. Times some constants.
And it turns out that these are projectors that these P alphas are projectors onto L21 subbundles and that contradict stability. So let me just, uh, I'm not going to explain why this is really true, but let's just examine this a little, a teeny bit here, which is to say that suppose we had S getting really big, but that this thing was bounded, right? Here we have a term which is potentially getting very big, which is the term, the term where lambda 2 minus lambda 1 is positive. All right, so remember S is getting very big, but then we rescaled it down to U. So the S thing is actually getting big by some factor. So this exponential is getting big by exponential of that factor. It's getting very big. Uh, and then we apply that to this matrix D double prime of S, okay? Remember, this is happening in the matrix. This is happening if we, if we divide into blocks by the eigenvalues of We draw, divide into blocks by the eigenvalues of S, then th this is happening in one, uh, in one half. Right, the e to the lambda 2 minus lambda 1 term is priming in the, say, the upper triangular or lower triangle piece. Okay? So half of the matrix is getting hit by this exponentially sized thing. Okay? And then this, this form here, we're, we're doing as kind of an inner product, so that's kind of positive. Okay, so, so that would have to be getting very big, but we're, we're assuming that m is bounded. That's kind of quadratically sized in terms of s. If, I mean, it's, in fact, exponentially sized in terms of s, right? Uh, so it's getting much bigger than any of the other terms. So the basic conclusion is that, I mean, from, that you can just see from the form of this function, is that those terms, that, that, uh, we then rescale s, those terms have to go to zero. Okay. So basically, the, 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 the d double prime of ui, the, the, the coefficients lambda 2 bigger than lambda 1, let's say, these have to go to zero. So the, the d double prime of p alpha times p alpha equals zero. This is what says that it's a subbundle. Then, then a, a slightly more subtle calculation, but in the same spirit, tells you that uh, with, the, with the curvature and so on, tells you that in fact that subbundle actually also, if you look at the diagonal terms, you get that that subbundle has to, I, I guess on the diagonal terms, this is just. Uh, this is just like one or something like that, or one half or something like that. This is cooked up so that on the diagonal terms, this just happens to exactly equal the curvature of H. There's a formula that the curvature of H in terms of the curvature of F, of F is given by a formula like this, basically. And so uh, when you do the calculation, you get that it you, the, the subbundles actually contradict stability. And then Ulan. This avoids the restriction theorem, yeah. So that's why I say Donaldson's proof, where, I mean, this all comes from Donaldson's paper where you need the, the restriction theorem. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to do the, I mean, to, to extend this to semi, to the semi-stable case, you need the re, definitely need the restriction theorem. So I think that's probably not known in the Kaler case, possibly. Uh, or at least some people have needed to do more work or something. Uh, but yeah, Donaldson's paper where he introduced this functional and so on, that was, he was, using the functional just on the surface. Uh, but so you might say what's replacing, the, in some sense, I guess, philosophical sense, what's replacing the restriction theorem is this theorem of ullenbeck gao which says the L2-1 subbundles are actually subsheaves, are reflexive subsheaves. So, a little unclear where you should go to find an actual good proof of this theorem, <laughs> I should say. Um, very difficult to understand in Ulenbeck Yao's paper. Um, there's a paper by Dan Popovici. It's also not very, not all that easy to understand uh, in the curve case. 
Um, in, fact, in fact, in the curve case, I convinced myself that this was true in the following way, which is solve the d-bar equation. Solve the d-bar equation in the subbundle. That sounds like an obvious thing to do. When you start to thinking about how to try to do that, you run up against the problem that it doesn't seem to work out because of Sobolev inequalities. Uh, what you actually have to do is, is do this in LP. You should not try to solve the d-bar problem in L2. That's not going to work because an L21 is not contained in, in C0 in, in L infinity. But, but that, it does actually work in LP uh, for P smaller than 2. I think it's small. So you can actually solve the d-bar. So, so this is how you can do the curve case. Then the higher dimensional case. The higher dimensional case is come, comes from a theorem of Schiffman. So he has a Hartog's theorem for measurable functions. So now I should say, like a mea culpa or something like that. Um, I don't know if this has really been correctly written up ever, but uh, this uses this uses a theorem of Hadamard on a formula for the zeros for the poles of a meromorphic function. Which, as far as I know, I'm not sure, I met, but somebody who's watching this on video is maybe sending me an email saying, oh, yeah, it's in 1948 or something like that. Um, the Hadamard was like from 1912 or something like that. When well, I went back and looked at Hadamard's paper, it was a really amazingly typical example of a, a, a case of proof by example. He said, okay, we're going to find you know, a formula for all the infinite number of poles of a meromorphic function. Let's do the first one. He does the first one. Let's do the second one. Then he says, oh, it just works like that. So, you know, uh, in terms of writing up the proof, so I don't know if anybody's really, but then I, I looked around at that a little bit, and it seems to be a standard thing in complex analysis, on the other hand. So I guess maybe it's in complex analysis textbooks, I think. Uh, but yeah, anyway, it does seem to be true. Uh, this is not really an easy theorem, in fact. Anyway, okay, so that's the theorem. So that's the proof. Okay. So, so, if we, so we have an L21 subsheaf. Uh, we have an L21 subbundle, which contradicts stability. And by the regularity theorem, it's a subsheaf. So we get a, so no C0 estimate. Contradicts stability. And what is this basically, so let's just think about the picture. How are we doing for time? What is this basically saying in the terms of the picture? The picture is basically the following, which is that, the, that our metric, if we take the unit ball for the metric, so draw if we draw unit balls in eight in each in each uh, subspace of the bundle for the metric, then it's going to start looking like this. This is going to be limiting to, uh, to a subbundle. That's the basic picture of what's going on. So the picture is really kind of easy to understand in some way. Uh, and so that, that's, what, that, that's what this whole proof says. I mean, this proof says that this Donaldson functional has this property, which says that if you, didn't, if you have a sequence of metrics which is getting long and thin, but if the Donaldson function is, remaining, is not getting, getting big, if it's remaining up bounded above, then, then if you sort of, you know, if you drew this on a computer, you would say, well, that's a straight line. You just put a straight line. I mean, that's a subspace, right? 
here this is a rank R bundle, so you know, in C to the R. We're gonna have some subspace where the metric is getting big, where the unit ball is getting big. You would say, okay, let's just replace that by a subspace, right? That sub, so th what this proof says is that subspace, if the Donaldson functional is, is remaining bounded, and because of this thing, which I guess I just erased here, because of the form of the Donaldson functional, which I just erased, this, this exponential part of the function, that tells you that that subspace actually has to be approximately holomorphic. And then a calculation with the turn class inside this functional tells you that that subspace was actually gonna contradict stability. Okay. So now let me just, before getting on, so that this is, so this, uh, so, so stable, the contrapositive stable gets a C0 estimate. And then, Nonlinear heat flow. Of course, you have to do some stuff here to prove that, but then the nonlinear heat flow converges to to a Hermitian Yang Mills metric. Okay. So now, let me, before getting on to the discussion about geography, let me just mention. Um, I think this. So. Well, I mentioned a, a student of mine, Cécile Duroy. So you can look this up if you put, if you put quotation marks around Cécile Duroy, the U, D R O U E T, and put it in Google Scholar, you'll find her thesis uh, in French. Um, but uh, it's actually a nice uh, article. Uh, What does this say? So this says that in fact there's some relationship. I think, I mean, uh, this, this was, philosophically, this was very present in Donaldson's paper, okay? But you can actually make this quite precise, or at least relatively precise, um, in the following way. So there's some relationship between Donaldson's functional and the kempf ness functional. Finite dimension. So let me just briefly uh, say how that works. So we have two operations. We have metrics on E. Then we have metrics on H0 of E of N. And let's remember, so remember we had H0 the, the canonical thing was H0 of E of N, this is from yesterday, tensor O of minus N, in the projective case, okay. Uh, and th this is really on a curve and everything. Uh, for a larger values of N, this surjects onto E, okay. And so let's fix them, you know, we fix a metric on here, so this has the Kähler metric gives you a metric on this bundle. Line bundle. So if you have a metric on H0 of E of N, then you can take the induced metric over here, which basically maps to taking the unit ball here and take the image of the unit ball, and that's given unit ball over here. Okay? So this is I. And then this, this operation, if we have a metric on E, then we can take the L2 metric on the, on the H0 space. And so one of the statements, so one statement says that, um, says that the Donaldson functional minus the kempf ness functional uh, I mean, we should turn the kempf ness functional into a function of two variables, right? So remember the kempf ness functional, the 
becomes an S functional of some metric, let's call it U, on on here. Uh, let's recall that this this was basically this was our, our distance to the origin. Uh, when we make a Plucker embedding of when we when we make an embedding of the moduli of, of the when we embed our, our point here, our Hilbert point or in our quote scheme point into a product of Grossmannians and then make a Plucker embedding of the Grossmannians and then make a Veronese embedding over the points. But then we integrate, now, then we let the number of points go to infinity in some density. So this is basically, I think there's some term here with the curvature, but uh, basically the integral over x of trace of log of the trace of i n of i u. So we take a metric here, we take the induced metric and we take the determinant. Uh, sorry, the determinant. It's just the induced metric. Right? If you have a quotient vector space, you have an induced metric. We have a metric, a vector space with a metric. Yeah. I have a quotient. You have an induced metric. We, 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 I mean, if you like, take the dual. The dual is an inclusion. You take the re restricted metric, but then dual. But it's also just taking the unit ball and projecting the unit ball. So we can sort of make a slightly abstracted version of the kind of finesse functional where we take infinitely many points by taking an integral over x of the log of the determinant of the induced metric. If you think about it a little bit, uh, let's not do that here, but if you think about it a little bit, that's really sort of, that's the kind of finesse metric where you chose infinitely many points densely uh, supported in. We, we, we want to take the log because when we, when we do the Veronese embedding, the line of the Veronese embedding is the tensor product of all the lines at all the different points. The lines at the points are the, for the Plucker embedding, they're the lambda top of E. Okay. Then when you do the Veronese, you're taking the tensor product of all those. So that's why there's a, and then, then you take the log of that, and the log of the tensor product is gonna be the sum of the determinants. So that's why it's the integral of the log of the determinants. Okay. And the, the statement is that this thing, uh, something like O of one over N. N is the N here. So this is N. So not only is there, are they, is these functionals philosophically related, but in fact they're actually, they actually approach each other. So the goal was to prove I mean, let's not say it this way. Um, a, a question is if we take minimize uh, the Kempf nest, like arg min, I mean, let's say, take the minimum of the Kempf nest functional on a metrics uh, of H0 of E of N, and then, then, then take the induced metric into, into metrics of E. We would like, uh, as, as N approaches infinity, uh, do these approach the HYM solution? And what Dewey proved Prove this for the minimum over L L of a compact of a fixed this wasn't really quite the full thing that uh, that you might like to say. Both. We have two maps, L and I, okay? We have L from metrics on E to metrics on H0, which is the L2 metric. And we have I, the induced metric, from metrics on H0 to metrics on E, okay? So what you would like to say, you'd like to say, okay, let's just look at the pure, do pure linear algebra. Let's do Kempf-Ness 
throw on Kempf Ness, Marsden and Weinstein if you want to say or something. The moment map stuff here in finite dimensions, find the minimum. The minimum is a unique UN orbit that's going to project to a unique connection, uh, to a unique metric on E. You would like to guess that that metric is going to slowly, as n gets to infinity, approach the Hermit Yang Mills, or maybe even possibly quickly approach the Hermit Yang Mills. Actually, I should say, Tony Pontev said that some physicists who were doing stuff like this and found that that actually had an excellent rate of convergence. So maybe the physicists already know how to do this, possibly. But, uh, and the theorem in Dewey's thesis is, is, a, is a version of that, but here you have to do a little bit something. Instead of looking at the minimum over the full space, you have to first take the L2 here and then take the minimum over that subspace uh, of a compact subset. I guess the problem here is that the fix, this compact subspace is fixed independent of n, and then you let n tend to infinity. Sorry? This, this kind of yeah, yeah, that's what I'm about to say. That's what I'm about to say. So now, uh, then there's Donaldson's work on. We take a fixed, sorry, this is a little small for you to go over there. We take a fixed compact subset of metrics of E, compact in C4 or something like that, and then take L of that. That gives you some subset of the metrics here, which is well defined independent of N. And then we can let n go get big after that. That's kind of, that, that was a difficult thing. Donaldson's work on case stability is basically the same type of thing. I think, the, I think that the start, the start was, as far as I know, kind of around the same time as Dewey was doing her thesis. The same kind of thing for uh, case stability. And Hermit and uh, Kaylor Einstein. Then there's been work by Julian Keller. Uh, I guess maybe I should say there's been work by somebody named Wang. I forget the first initial. In this uh, in this setup, then Julian Keller. All this on something stuff called balanced metrics. So somehow there, it's very it's a very similar setup, but maybe I'm not sure the details are exactly precisely the same. Uh, I'm just not sure about that. I didn't check that or anything. So this may well have the solution. I'm not quite sure if it really gives a solution to the question, but it does give a solution to some similar question in any case. So let me just say, how are we doing for time here? Maybe I, uh, I'll have two, two minutes for my geography. Okay. Um, so I think, I mean, in the mean, you know, in the meantime, after uh, Dewey's thesis. Uh, there's been a lot of advances, and I have to say I haven't really looked back myself and to see uh, to see what what you could do and so on. Uh, but so maybe so well, let me just end this segment by uh, an, another question. As I said, Tony Pontev told me some stuff like maybe the physicists have already been doing this for ten years or something like that, possibly. But uh, uh, having learned PyTorch, so we'll, we'll talk, be talking about that on Friday. Thank you, Sir Soren. Uh, <laughs> um, thanks to Soren, I've learned PyTorch. PyTorch is an amazing thing. Uh, I'll, I'll have a more math history discussion on Friday. But uh, it allows you to do gradient descent on like thousands of variables, tens of, even mil, I don't know about a million, but at least 100,000 variables. A function of 100,000 variables, you can do gradient descent on your home, on your laptop computer. So I think if, um, with a little bit of programming, it really should be no problem whatsoever to really find the minimum of the kempf Ness functional in actual, I mean, the only problem is writing down the equation of a curve is not gonna be so easy, so you would wanna probably first transform this into a question about parabolic bundles on P1, so you could write down polynomials on P1 and stuff like that, but you'd have to think about what it says for parabolic bundles and stuff like that. Maybe there's a little bit of transformational problem, but I mean, in, in principle, there should be no problem in putting this into PyTorch, just doing the gradient descent and just seeing whether you actually get a solution or not. Um, anyway, I just, I'm saying PyTorch any, any Use auto grad descent.
So you should be actually you should actually be able to plot uh, you should be able to plot the solution to Narasim and Sachadri equations. Uh, let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, so now let me so that's the end of that segment. Let me start back up. Uh, it, you know, especially if this actually does converge, I mean, I think it probably should. Okay, so now what about geography? Uh, so once we're given the Bogomol of Gizekur inequality, so So we're going to be looking at M as some, so let's say X is a surface. Oh, sorry, she's not supposed to do that. We've seen that if we wanted to make a moduli space, then we should have some kind of stability, and if not, probably the main thing, let's we'll start with the classical kind of stability. You guys will maybe do some other original instability, but. Um, and Sarbeswar has given us a good introduction to this already. We look at the moduli space of bundles on, on our surface with rank R and given C1 and C2. The Bogomol of Gisegor inequality tells us that, uh, that delta, which is roughly speaking C2, uh, is positive. Okay. Now, historically, people started looking at these moduli spaces a lot more. Uh, maybe I should say the, the, the references are like uh, Gisegor you know, Mumford and so on. Isikur Mahayama, basically, for existence. Um, but people, people started looking at these things a lot more after Donaldson theory, so. Uh, if you want to make Donaldson invariants, you would like to have a, have this moduli space to be approximately generic in the sense of Donaldson invariance, and at least it should be uh, have the right dimension, for example. So, so this was motivation for some kind of uh, research into into the properties of these moduli spaces. But people were happy to have C two big. So so for delta the delta invariant very big, then we have uh, it's a good, which means generically smooth of the expected dimension. And irreducible. And so this is like, uh, I think Donaldson had did some I'm probably forgetting some people here, but uh, Donaldson zero V. Uh, who am I forgetting? I, I'm thinking, but anyway, the, I mean, let's just say, as Sarbeswar pointed out, the main, the main results, the main, the best case, the best statement of the results is by O'Grady uh, for this. O'Grady gives actual explicit bounds for this thing. Okay. Although, but if you put, if you plug the explicit bounds into an example, it still doesn't. It comes out to some answer, but it's not optimal. But so this tells us, in any case, that for high values of C2, then we have some kind of uh, uh, freedom. Okay. So let me just. Uh. Maybe I'll just start next time with. I'm getting late, later and later here this way, but I'll just start next time by rephrasing the theorem. Let me just draw the picture. Okay. So if you if you make a tent, right, a circus or something like that, uh, 
If you make a tent for a circus, for example, let me just finish with my picture. If you make a tent for a circus, if the, tent, if the strings are all pulled as tight as possible, then the, the, the fabric is rigidified into a certain position. Okay, so so it, it, it has a certain, has nice properties. Okay, so this is some kind of maximal, maximal or minimal. You know, it's some, some kind of extremal. Now what happens if we loosen up the tent a little bit? If we loosen up the tent a little bit, then it's going to sort of start flapping around, right? But it's still going to be sort of constrained. So th then this is like complicated. If we, if we loosen everything up a lot, we just like cut the cords free, then the tent is just going to sort of fly away, right? Okay, so, so if we're close to some bound, then there, if, if, we're at the, if we're at the maximum of some inequality, then everything is very rigid. There's a, there's a so let's call this a, the, the, bio, the math biologists call this transient. There's a transient range where there's some constraint, but um, complicated stuff is happening. Then if you just, if you're far away from the bound, that's this C2 positive, very positive, then everything becomes very sort of free and so on. Okay. So that's, that, that's kind of the picture of the philosophy here, which I think we can apply this philosophy, I mean, it's maybe kind of silly, but I think we can apply this philosophy to a lot of different things. We'll see that on Friday again a little bit. Um, so, for, for, so let me just finish by making a question to, for Oscar, which I think you could actually ask this philosophy uh, for the question of the Toledo invariant. So you guys are looking at the case of maximal Toledo invariant. But has anybody looked at what happens if like maybe D is really big or something, so the Toledo invariant is kind of big, but maybe you're close to the maximal Toledo invariant, but you're not at the maximal Toledo invariant. So at the maximal Toledo invariant, you have like disconnected moduli spaces. Submaximal, maybe they're connected. But is it possible that they look sort of geometrically not very connected? I mean, maybe they would like have uh, like a long tube or something like that separating different pieces, possibly. Uh, Anyway, so, so I mean, you can ask that type of question, and in particular, you can ask that type of question for the case of, of bogomol gieskar inequality. This extremal case is the flat case. And so I'll, I'll, I'll maybe start a little teeny bit of that next time. So let me stop. Questions, comments? <laughs> yeah, so uh, about the Toledo invariant situation, uh, in the cases that uh, is a very interesting question, uh, it is believed that is always connected component if the Toledo invariant is not maximal. In many cases it's proof, but we don't have a general proof yet. In fact, it's the only remaining case to uh, give an answer, complete answer, to what are the connected components of any real group. Ah, ah, okay. right? But it is true that as you are closer to the uh, to the uh, maximum, uh, something nice happens uh -uh. in terms of the rank of the Higgs field, and uh, ah, okay. so uh, yeah, there is something very interesting. As 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 you approach the maximal, the maximal Toledo, then the rank of the Higgs field is uh, larger and larger. So there are jumps in terms of going from one orbit to another, things like that. I don't know if it is related to what you have in mind, but that's yeah. Does this, hello, yeah, this relationship between the, 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 the minimization of the Kempfness functional and this, would that give a different proof for uh, Donaldson's main theorem? You know? I, I mean, I doubt if it could. I mean, the, this calculation was only for a curve, for one thing. Uh, I mean, maybe, may possibly in like the far future, conceivably. Uh, I think the, 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 the statement that they're the, the similar had to use analytic torsion and stuff like that, which was, um, let's simplify things too much. Yeah, I'm not sure. it's, I mean, I think the question is more, not really to prove, give a proof, but the question would be to, to see if you can give some kind of calculation, basically. I mean, because of the nature of the L1 kind of stuff is there in Yao's proof. 
whether that should be. Well, that's supposed to not show up, and uh, theoretically speaking, I mean, Yao's proof says that uh, says that Eventually. if it's not stable, I mean, it says that if there's no C1 bound, then it would have to not be stable. So it means if you started with something that was stable, then you're never supposed to see that. I mean, that's what you would like. That's the first question you'd have for the for your computer simulation would be, um, is it really? Do you really see a C? I mean, you shouldn't. I mean, you shouldn't see a, you should, It should be going down uh, to a minimum rather quickly. I mean, at least as I said, that's what Tony. More questions? Yeah, that was his question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I doubt if that would be simpler. I think it might be significant. Uh, for, uh, might be able to do a without without the Urenberg, you have theorem. No. Ah, to avoid. Ah. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I didn't think about that. I mean. Uh, you mean using the fact, using this, the comparison between the two functionals? Yeah, I wonder if uh, the Eulenberg theorem. Well, as I said, this is difficult because um, uh, this thing is difficult. We, uh, you, you had to look to some subspace of the metrics which has very nice properties already. I mean, where, uh, I mean, but on the, on the, as I said, on the other hand, I, I haven't really looked at the case stability thing. Do the case stability people get new proofs of? Existence of Hermit of Kähler Einstein metrics? Do, do, they, do they prove existence of Kähler Einstein metrics this way? I mean, if you could do that, I suppose you could do it here too. This should be easier than Kähler Einstein in principle. I mean, <laughs> you know. And so it's possible also that Julian Keller might actually have already done that. Uh, he's worked on this for bundles. Also, do you think uh, that uh, the yeah, theorem is essential for the proof of uh, existence of Einstein uh, metric. Uh, well, you know, Donaldson's proof, Donaldson's first proof, yeah. uh, Donaldson's paper using the Donaldson functional used Metaronomanathan restriction theorems, uh, yeah. and didn't you didn't need Ulenbeck uh, Yao's proof? So I mean, it's not essential, but at least for the projective case or something. But uh, it's just much, extremely much easier. I mean, of course, it's a difficult theorem, but once you have that theorem. It's extremely much easier to the, the the comparison, the restriction comparison. You had to do some kind of comparison of the secondary invariance between the the, the variety and the and the hyperplane section, which was not not easy at all. Any further questions, comments? If not, let's thank Carlos again. <laughs>